Hello, and welcome to Game Gems. Today, we're going to look at a few different ways to manage your scene tree with regards to adding and removing subscenes. You probably already know that everything in Godot is considered a scene, including your level. You probably also know that in order to transition from one level to another, or even to start your game, you need to unload the existing level, or start menu, and load a new one. If you're new to Godot, you've probably learned to do this at the root level. Your start menu and or level scenes are set as the root scene of your scene tree, and to load a new level, you call the load method and use something like the change scene to file method to swap them. This is all well and good for a quick and dirty way to change levels, but once you start getting into a bit more advanced game designs, you'll notice that it's a little bit lacking. For example, the most basic problem with this method is that the load method is what we call a blocking method, which means that the game freezes until it's finished. This is fine if you're loading a tiny scene on a powerful PC, because the freeze is so brief that it's almost unnoticeable, but I'll bet you mobile developers are already nodding your heads and understanding it what this means for your hardware testing. Low-end mobile devices often take longer to load data files than PCs, so the more resources and subnodes in your level, the longer it's going to take for that device to switch scenes. And since the load method is a blocking call, your app may appear to have frozen while the load is completing. Both Apple and Google have strict guidelines about things like app responsiveness, so an app completely locking your device during scene transitions is probably going to get rejected. Okay, so you may be thinking, well, I'll put up a loading scene before I trigger the scene transition so the user knows it's loading. And that would be fine, except you still have a non-responsive screen that gives the user node feedback as to how long it's going to be in this state or that it's even doing anything. So you might think that you can put up a progress bar or animation of some kind, except the load method is a blocking call, which means again that nothing will process while the load is completing, including your animation. You're back to square one. But that's not your only problem. Completely unloading your root scene means you'll lose everything that was attached to it. Player data, UI state, playing music, everything. Sure, you can stash some of those things in auto-loaded singletons, but you still have to restore it all upon loading the new scene. It just doesn't make sense from a workload perspective to do all that every time, especially if you're making an adventure game or a Metroidvania where the only thing you're doing is changing the room. Convinced yet? Hopefully so, or you're probably about to click through to another video. Let's get started. The first thing that we'll need to do is decide on our application structure. I've been a big fan of games like Wizardry and The Bard's Tale since I was a kid. Yes, I'm that old. So let's look at a fairly common use case for subscenes, transitioning between dungeon maps. RPGs tend to have a fairly complex UI and data structures at their heart, so it just doesn't make sense to load and unload them every time players move to a new area. So we're going to set up our applications so that they persist. The game scene, which represents our entire application, contains our UI, as well as our main scene, which represents the primary game view and contains the game world itself. The dungeon we'll be mucking around in is also parented to the main scene, but note that the player is not a child of it. This is slightly odd conceptually. After all, if the player is in the dungeon, it should be a child of the dungeon, right? Well, you can definitely add some code to your dungeon scene to either spawn a player sprite inside it, or move an avatar from the player data node to inside the dungeon, but that's a bit beyond the scope of what we're trying to do here, so I'll leave that as an exercise to you for later. The fact is, there's probably a dozen different ways to get your player into your dungeon after it loads. So as not to have to deal with player movement code, triggers, and input handling, I've set up a single key press to swap the dungeon with a new one every time I press the X key on my keyboard. We'll look at progressively more complex ways of loading a new dungeon, starting with a simple load call. You know, the thing we're ultimately trying to avoid. Here's the method I'm calling when the user presses the X key. It checks to see if the currently displayed map is map 1, and if it is, we load map 2. If it's map 2, we load map 1. In a real game, you're going to want a more complex way of handling this logic, but we've only got two maps, so we're good. Once we have our new map loaded, we remove the current map from the tree by calling remove child. We do not unload the root scene. Once the map has been removed, we instantiate the new map and add it to the tree. And in so doing, everything else in our scene carries on as if nothing happened. We haven't lost any of our player data or needed to reinitialize the UI. Make sure in this particular case that the player Z sort is set to the layer above the map, otherwise when the new map loads, you won't be able to see the players anymore because they'll be behind the map in the tree. Now, let's take a step up and add a very basic loading screen to mask the transition. Here's a variant of the method I was originally using to load the new scene. As you can see, the code is very similar, except I'm setting the visibility of my loading screen to true prior to triggering the blocking load. We don't want to load the loading scene before we instantiate it, because again, the load method blocks, so calling a blocking method to mask a blocking method makes no sense. And now you're blocking twice. At this point, you're probably wondering how this is any better than what you were doing before. The answer is, once you add asynchronous loading into the mix, you can create more complex scene transitions that include animation and other visual effects. For example, 
Here's the final version of my scene transition. The map fades out, a small animated spinner appears in the corner of the main display, and then the new map fades in. If we simply unloaded the entire scene or used the stock load call, we wouldn't be able to do any of this because the UI would go away and the load would block the animations from running. Let's see how it's done. Keep in mind that this isn't the cleanest way to handle this kind of transition, but it is the most straightforward. You'll probably want to encapsulate the loading process into an animated loading scene, and there's plenty of tutorials on YouTube utilizing Godot's progress bar controls that do just that. I encourage you to check them out after you get familiar with this process. Instead of calling load on our new map, we store its resource path so that we can use it later. We then hide the players and create a tween to change the current map's modulate property, specifically its alpha component, from 1, the current value, to 0. Once I set the game's default clear color to black in the project settings, this causes the map to fade out. We use an await command to tell Godot to pause here until the tween is done fading, and then we enable our animated loading control and tell the spinner's animator to play. After that, we remove the existing map from our scene and pass the path we defined earlier into the resource loader's load threaded request method, which is what kicks off the asynchronous load. Meanwhile, in our scene's process method, we check if the animated loading control is visible. If it is, we want to get the status of the load. If it's complete, we get the resulting packed scene from the resource loader, instantiate it, and here I force a one second pause so you can actually see what's happening, then add it to the map. Stop the animation and force it to tween its modulate properties alpha component from 0 to 1 so that it fades in. Once it's done fading, we re-enable the players and our new map is ready for exploring. And that's it! Thinking of your levels as smaller components of your overall game architecture rather than an all-encompassing blob allows you to do some pretty interesting things and ultimately make your games better and easier to manage. If you found this tutorial useful, don't forget to like and subscribe for more game gems. See you next time!